I love when you clap for me, it's great. <laughs> Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, my name's Jorge Amigo. I'm the head of cultural programming at the Vancouver Public Library here in the Alice Mackay Room. And this is another season of the Inside Series where the Writers' Festival brings some of the most exciting writers in the world right here to your library. So before we begin, I want to acknowledge that we're hosting this event from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. I'm a settler in these lands, which means I have a responsibility to continually learn about the ongoing effects of colonialism in this part of the world and to take sincere actions towards reconciliation, especially in my role as a public servant here for your library. Now, speaking of learning, I want to take a second to tell you about something I was just reading. The Yellowhead Institute's latest report on Canada's progress in reconciliation. Um, as you may remember, in 2015, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission came up with 94 calls to action and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau personally promised to fully implement them. Now, how are we doing with that? Well, it turns out that after eight years, only 13 of the 94 calls to action have been completed since 2015, and we completed zero calls to action last year. That is a completion rate of less than two calls to action per year. So if Canada continues at this pace, it will take another 58 years until the calls to action are completed, completed meaning that indigenous people will wait until 2081 for reconciliation. So I think that a land acknowledgement is only meaningful if it leads to some form of action. So I hope that what I just shared with you will inspire you to go home and Google the Yellowhead Institute's 2023 report. It's right there on their front page. And read, read it, it's only 16 pages long. And learn about how we're failing, why we're failing, and the impact that it has on our society. Take a second. Please. Change of pace now. Let's get into some housekeeping notes and get the event started. So, a quick show of hands, who has been to an inside event before? Wow, awesome. Woo. Uh, who uh, has been to an inside event uh, last year? Okay, a few of you. Awesome. So, um, and who's been to a library event that is not an inside event in this space? Okay, so we got most of the audience in that giant Venn diagram. So before I pass it on to Leslie, I have a few reminders for you. The first one is that I'm going to ask you a favor. If you need to exit the room, this is not the ballet, it's not the opera. You can come in and out as many times as you want, but please use the door in the back. So James over there is gonna be very happy if we don't make noise on the front door. So go to the back, that's the door to use. Um, the washrooms are located right outside this, this, uh, that door to the right. So they're right there, washrooms. And then we have a new water fountain. Um, that's amazing. So if you need water, you can go fill up your water bottle there. A lot of people complain that they have to go to the bathroom to do that. Um, the last thing that's very obvious, but please, please pay attention to this one, your cell phones. You have these machines in your pockets that make a lot of noise and it distracts people around you and the people on stage. So make sure that they're not making any noise. You're welcome to keep them on. Uh, in fact, we encourage you to take them out, take pictures, post on social media that you're at a very cool inside event at the library. That's totally fine. Just make sure they're not making any noise. That's it from me. And now let me pass the torch to Leslie Hurdig, who is the Artistic Director of the Vancouver Writers' Festival. Thanks so much, Jorge. And thank you for that land acknowledgement, which was um, very meaningful, and that's good information for all of us to have. Good evening and welcome to our first Insight of 2024 and what a pleasure it is to see all of you here in the Alice Mackay Room and also hello to all of you watching online tonight. 
I know we had a really great um, rate of sign up for this particular event, so we're really glad that you're all here with us. We couldn't ask for a better way to kick off the year than with best-selling Smitten Kitchens, Deb Perlman, and uh, we're just delighted that she's here with us tonight. Great thanks to our Insight partner, the Vancouver Public Library, for their collaboration and for giving us such a warm room to gather in. We also want to thank our government sponsors this evening, the Government of Canada, the Government of BC, City of Vancouver, the BC Arts Council, and CMHC Granville Island, which is where our home is on Granville Island. For those of you who are new to Insight and the Vancouver Writers' Fest, this series, Insight, runs every other Wednesday from now until the end of May, with the exception of a couple of weeks. And you can always just check our website to find out what's coming up next. For instance, next up on the 7th of February, we've just solidified today that we've got a great Canada Reads event coming up, and that is going to be featuring the author Taya Muntanji in conversation with her Canada Reads champion, who is actor Kudashwe Rutendo. And I think that's going to be a really fun event because for those of you who follow Canada Reads, um, it's really gearing up right now, and by the 7th of February, we will be right well into it. And Taya's book is fantastic for those of you who haven't read it yet. In just a few moments, I will be welcoming Deb and Bronwyn to the stage, and they'll chat for about an hour before turning it over to you, our audience at home and our audience here, to ask some questions of your own. And then following that, com um, that conversation, tonight Deb will be signing books actually over here tonight, uh, courtesy of our wonderful bookseller, Black Bond Book Warehouse. And as you can see, they've got books for sale and uh, these make great gifts for yourself, great gifts for loved ones, so stock up, stock up now on all of those signed books. Now to introduce our moderator for this evening, uh, before the holidays, I knew her as the author of the gorgeous poetry collection, The Silk That Moths Ignore, um, which Ross Gay, by the way, described as poems that somehow illuminate the deepest interior while leaving dirt under your fingernails. I love that. I also know her to be an esteemed assistant professor of teaching and undergraduate chair at UBC's School of Creative Writing. But what I did not realize until I was fortunate enough to sink my fork into not one, but two of her delicious homemade cakes is that she is a passionate cook and baker and a great follower of Deb Perlman's. So please welcome Bronwyn Tate and Deb Perlman. this way. Hey everybody, uh, such a pleasure to be here with you in a library, one of the best possible spaces, <laughs> with Deb, one of the best possible people. Um, probably Deb doesn't need an introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. So Deb Perlman has been described as an obsessive home cook, um, and I feel like there's two really key words there, obsessive. Uh, when I was, you know, running from store to store to try to find an artichoke because I just had to try a new recipe, I'm, I'm like, Deb would understand, <laughs> right? Um, but also home cook, right? So not someone who's used to a full restaurant brigade and someone else chopping the onions, someone who chops her own onions. Um, so Deb is the creator of the wildly popular Smitten Kitchen food blog. My kids were like, oh, are you going to meet Ms. Smitten. <laughs> it's like, well, yes, I am. <laughs> um, she's also the author of three cookbooks, so beyond your dad's two-book deal into a three-book deal. He must be very impressed. So the Smitten Kitchen Cookbook, Smitten Kitchen Every Day, and Smitten Kitchen Keepers, uh, which I gave my mom for Christmas last year and then cooked from a whole bunch while I was with my parents over the holidays, which was very sweet. And you can see all the stickies from everything I've made. Um, so I've been 
cooking Deb's food since at least 2010, possibly earlier. I used to have a food blog called Bread and Jam for Francis when I was a, yeah, an MFA student in like 2003. Um, and I think maybe the first thing of yours that I could find a record of having cooked was um, the shakshuka with sauteed spinach on toast, right? That's a good one. Still make that one. Yeah. Um, so I love... Deb and her food and her writing about food, uh, partly because I relate to both the, the home cooking and the obsession, um, and also because I feel like she's someone who really connects people. So my aunt, who may be watching from Texas, um, finally someone that you know who is not a poet, who I am doing an event with. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, we connected over our appreciation for Deb's eggplant in Voltini filled with ricotta. If you haven't tried those ones, they're good. Um, there's so many people who are sharing a recipe, recommending something, realizing that you have the same favorite recipe, um, brings you together, gives you something to connect about. And so it's my real pleasure and honor to be here in conversation with Deb and to welcome you to Vancouver and to this Insight event. <laughs> Are we audible? Yeah. yeah? OK, terrific. I teach a big poetry class, so I'm always like, can you hear me in the back? <laughs> um, so I want to begin just by kind of going back in time a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you started, you know, Smitten Kitchen, a blog, trying out recipes. How quickly did that become a bigger thing? And what were some of the kind of crunch points or growth points where <laughs> it changed for you? Ooh, so I started Smitten Kitchen in 2006, um, which is wild, because that's a really long time ago, and I actually have not aged at all since then, so <laughs> it's kind of amazing how the math works there. <laughs> um, but I had just started it because I was interested in cooking, and I wanted to have a collection of my forever recipes, and I was making things that I liked, that I wanted to repeat, but with some adjustments, and then I was making things that I didn't like, and I wanted you to make them differently if you were gonna make them. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, but I didn't expect it to last because I didn't have any cooking authority, I didn't have any cooking experience. So I kind of thought it was gonna be about a six month endeavor, okay. and then I would have to figure out what I was really going to do. Uh -huh. And instead, I'm still here, um, which is wild. Um, but I, I would say I, it, I decided to make it, not decided, I, I felt like I could pull it off as my full-time job by January 2008. Mm -hmm. um, I should probably clarify that I did not have a very fancy day job at that time. It wasn't <laughs> like I was a doctor. like, oh no, we've been so lost without Deb. She was <laughs> our best writer. <laughs> so, um, so it was a little easy. It was an easy time for me to jump ship. Um, so I guess maybe then? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So at first, I know, and I'm, I mean, I think you still do an amazing job responding to comments, <laughs> but what was that like for you to sort of be like, oh, I can respond to every comment and then like, hang on a minute, there's a lot of people. This is a volume that's like... <laughs> Would maybe be a job itself just responding to comments? I know. I know. I have never really figured out how to scale the operation, to be honest. Yeah. I just do less every year. And I mean less as in I'm less productive, but I don't really <laughs> wish to change oh. what I do. And it's because I don't want to outsource. I wouldn't mind have a stranger yeah. responding to comments in my voice or... I just imagine the amount of time I would have to explain things to people. I don't like explaining things. I like explaining things in recipes, but I don't like explaining things to people about how to do it. So I'm very bad at outsourcing email and comments and taking photos and recipe editing and proofreading and putting together my newsletter and shooting video and then editing the video and managing my social media. So I'm really bad at outsourcing these things. So I just do it when I have time and sure. that's it. I mean, it's a lot of jobs and a it's lot of skills. It's a lot of jobs. Yeah, it's yeah. a little weird. Um, so sometimes the site's quiet for a couple weeks. Sometimes I get more videos out the door. So that's kind of how it is. Mm -hmm. What about cookbooks? So had you always had in mind that you'd like to do an actual a cookbook versus the blog, or how did that come about? I feel like when you do stuff in food, people very early on start talking to you about cookbooks. And I actually had very little desire to write a cookbook, which is strange, but most of what I heard about cookbooks at that time from people who were coming out of the blog space like yeah. early on, 
is they weren't very happy with the experience they'd had. They didn't feel like they had a lot of say in it, or like maybe the cover wasn't the cover they wanted, or them in a certain way, yeah, and to be, reduce them to uh-huh. like like they were considered like flashes in the pants. Sure. They were writing like you know fifty cookies to you know eat at Christmas and please have this to us before in two months, you know, and it just didn't seem like a very good experience. So I wasn't that excited by it. And also I had this very cool. I had a website where I could just cook whatever I wanted and work for nobody. Um, And I didn't know I couldn't just do that forever, which honestly, I still struggle with. (laughs) Um, So what convinced you? um, My agent actually convinced me. Um, I was about like this pregnant with my son. (laughs) I was like waddling around New York City. And I did take a meeting with her. And I I was like, I told her, I'm I'm not going to write a book, but I will sit down and meet with you because... I, we knew people in common, and she seemed like a nice person, but I was very clear with her that I was not going to write a book. Um, mm-hmm. And um, I don't know, I left her office about an hour later, and I was like, I think I'm going to write a couple cookbooks. No, and not I, just one. I don't know how she did that, but she <laughs> sort of painted a picture for me that was very appealing. Um, and basically where she suggested that I may have some more control in the process sure. than I thought. Um, so that was a very long way of saying it. But, um, but yeah, so you can, I can thank my agent, or you can, or, or, you know, not thank her if you don't like the books. <laughs> but I hope that's not the case. <laughs> um, I want to ask you, I mean, I think people are here probably because they find pleasure in cooking, um, but cooking can also become really a chore. We, we have to keep doing it every day, whether we like it or not, whether we're in the mood or not. Um, how do you, especially when it is both you know, feeding your family and also your job, how do you continue to find pleasure in cooking? <laughs> Um, I'm a really big fan, and I there is definitely some privilege in the statement, but I'm a very big fan of when you're super burnt down on cooking to not do it. Um, I'm not saying not feed your family and not feed yourself. Like, this is what frozen tortellini is for. This is what oh, yeah. frozen pot stickers is for. There's a lot of things that you can do that are perfectly acceptable ways to eat that will not take a lot of energy out of you. And I Shout think out that to you dumplings just, with frozen peas. Yeah, dumplings <laughs> with frozen peas. We've got like, you know, mac and cheese, but uh-huh. like you put some broccoli in there, yeah. so it's like basically balanced. It's basically <laughs> a salad. There's so many things you can do. This is where like the spaghetti with butter and parm, you know, that yep. kind of thing. There's a lot of things you could do. I think that you don't deplete what very limited energy you have left and I think Mm -hmm. I try to like ride that as long as I can and of course I live in Manhattan and so I have a lot of access to take out although when you're doing it for a family of four you have to ask how much it's worth it Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) sometimes it is sometimes it's not so we try not to do it too often Um, but we have that access too so I basically just try to ride it out and hope that after a couple days my energy to cook will come back to me Mm -hmm. and if it doesn't I don't know. I guess we have a different issue. But in general, sure. I feel like if I have to eat a few You don't another, force it. You just wait till you're like, oh, that looks good, or that sounds interesting. Sounds good. Or mo- generally speaking, yeah. what I didn't want to make was the thing I had said I was going to make, or uh-huh. the thing that I bought groceries for. Two days before, I was going to make it, because I was sure on Thursday I'd want to make this. And that's always where I hit that impasse, because you uh-huh. have to get through that. But um, Or maybe I just didn't. My kids are being extra picky, and yeah. that kind of can take a little of the joy out of cooking, you know? How are your kids, and how is cooking with kids for you? <laughs> I think that's how we've connected a little bit before, <laughs> is I, I have, we both have kids around the same age, we both have eight-year-old daughters, and you have 14-year-old, I have an 11-year-old. I've been trying to get my kids to kind of take charge of dinner one night a week, and they pick the recipe, and then wow. I kind of sous chef them, and then they've cooked I your food a lot. That. Okay, I'm really impressed by that. I'm gonna go home and have a talk with my kids about <laughs> what a disappointment they are to me. <laughs> It might be true that I don't give them the space in the kitchen they would need to. It also like ebbs and flows. When I get busy with grading and I'm not there to like be real patient with them, Uh it like can ease out for a bit. But we pick it back up again. We're working on it. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So there's not as much cooking with kids as one might expect. Um, I think that my kids think that they know how to cook Mm. without having actually cooked many things. And I think it's just because it's around them. In the atmosphere. And um, they also don't want to listen to me, Um, (laughs) which is true for every aspect of our relationship. Uh But 
we're getting there. We're working on like, you know, a recipe here and there. For example, since I'm going to be away tomorrow, I was Mm -hmm. suggesting to my son has like a day off from high school, which I can't even. (laughs) Anyway, so I told my husband that they should make like one of the ZDs or something like that and Mm -hmm. walk. Maybe he'll maybe he'll listen if my husband explains the recipe to him. I don't know if any of you have any high school boys, but mine doesn't mine doesn't hear me Mm -hmm. anyway. um, But so but he's my actually my biggest fan. He's um, a huge he's a he loves he's a big fan. He wants to hear about everything that I'm doing. Doing. I get in trouble with him if my newsletter comes out late in the week. Oh. Um, he, yeah, so he lets me know that my newsletter is late. So it's very cute, and he's a pretty. It's like you could just ask me at dinner. <laughs> no, he did remind me that my newsletter went on a day late this week, and I, I'm aware of that. Um, <laughs> so, um, but he he likes food, and he's curious about food, and he's generally interested in trying new things, which is great. Unfortunately, I have a second child, <laughs> and whatever I just said, it's the opposite. Like mm. the opposite of every one of those statements. Um, she's not really into food. What does she like? Well, she has expensive taste. She likes lobster. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, she likes caviar, we've discovered, which okay. I don't think we can afford her. Um, <laughs> she likes caviar. She likes lobster. She likes um, potato chips. She likes potato chips with caviar. I mean, she's eight years old. Uh-huh. I like. We're not fancy. I don't know how. It's she like she had it once at New Year's, and now she's like, this is the that's food that exactly I like. It. Yeah, and uh-huh. she's she's a quarter Russian, so yeah, that's sure, that's part. Is she quarter? Sure, sure. Yeah, no, she's half Russian. My husband's Russian. Yeah. Oh my goodness, math. Um, so yeah, so she's half Russian, so maybe it's in her blood. And she likes buttered noodles. Okay. And she yeah. likes French fries, and she likes raw vegetables yeah. like don't put dressing Crunchy on things. them yeah don't cook them um so it sounds okay you put that together you're like that's a pretty good diet but have you ever tried to cook dinner for this person because mm. that there's no like chicken parm or spaghetti meatballs or turkey pot pie or like you know chicken marsala there's none of these things are in there so i don't i can't tell you what she eats i don't know honestly <laughs> i'm very spoiled my kids eat Everything they say except radicchio, mayonnaise, and cream cheese. My that son, is amazing. Cream cheese. Radicchio is their enemy. It's a but, tricky one. Yeah. Although I've just in the last year I've gotten I love really in, I love radicchio, but I got really into soaking my anti radicchio and all those it makes bitter a difference. in cold water yeah. and make it juicier and sweeter. Even like and the less really bitter. bitter. Yeah, it makes a huge difference. Because if you have a like a radicchio salad at a restaurant, it's always so juicy and crisp. Mm-hmm. But at home, it's mm-hmm. kind of bitter. But think of how long it's been dehydrating on the shelf. Yes. So I feel like it makes a big difference to soak it in cold water. Everyone soak your lettuces. It also washes it while you're at it. Beautiful mm-hmm. hot tip. Um, are there any like food stories in your family? <laughs> so for me, one time I was uh, trying to make pie crust for Thanksgiving <laughs> and I like hadn't had enough moisture and then I just got like incredibly tense. Mm-hmm. And when anyone came near me, I would basically like <laughs> swear at them. <laughs> and so now I like, I've made so many pies since then and I'm like very chill about it, <laughs> but they're always like, uh oh, mom's <laughs> making pie crust. Is it gonna go bad? <laughs> Are there like foods that have a story or a reputation in your house? We have several. <laughs> we have several. Well, from the house I grew up in, um, yeah. we have this, it's a chocolate roll cake, and it's on the side. It's not the one with ice cream. It's the um, heavenly chocolate cake roll. It's a really classic. It's, it's like a whipped so cream good. inside? Yeah, whipped cream. It's mm. super fragile. It breaks all the time. And uh-huh. my mother, who's not a big cursor, like, but words would come out of her mouth when she would roll it. And yeah. we, for mostly, we call it the, the sh- okay. Say this. Yeah, we, call, yeah. we call it the shit cake uh-huh. um, <laughs> because she cursed so often when she was rolling uh-huh. it. Um, let's see. We probably have quite a few. But my husband's favorite story about me with food, and it's not even with cooking. It was when we were in Paris many years ago, and you know, at the end of the meal, they bring out that cheese plate sometimes, and you just pick a couple, and they give you a little piece on your plate. And I took a bite. I was like, this is the best cheese I've ever had in my entire life. And he's like, that's butter. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> I mean, my friend It Kate, was a cultured butter. Yeah. <laughs> it had some, anyway, I think that's like everything you need to know about my palate. <laughs> There's a cheese my friend Kate calls God's butter. I, yeah, that so, sounds like my perfect cheese. Yeah. I would really like that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm 
I'm never living it down. I don't want to live it down. I'm fine. <laughs> Butter's delicious. It's so good. Yeah. Especially in France. <laughs> sure. Um, I want to ask you about cooking for other people. Because mm. um, I know your cookbooks often have sort of like, you know, how to do a party mm. or like, here's the appetizers you can make ahead of time <laughs> so that you're not maybe cursing over the frying pan with somebody. Um, and I feel like, you know, People are just starting maybe now to have people over a mm -hmm. little bit more. I moved to Vancouver in 2020 and like I've missed cooking for people and sort of having someone chopping near me in the kitchen. So like mm -hmm. reclaiming that's been really beautiful. But I just wondered if you had any kind of thoughts about cooking for people. What do you enjoy about it? What's challenging about it? Do you have any <laughs> tips on how to cook for people? How long do you have? Mm -hmm. I love having people over. First of all, I will actually never get the apartment cleaned up unless we have the fear yeah. of people showing up that day. There are so many projects that we will just put off. Like, why would I spend a Saturday deep cleaning my apartment unless people are coming over that night? And then it's just the apartment looks so good afterwards. It's so good. So that's the first reason. Totally selfish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I also just like having people over. It's, you know, it's expensive to go out for dinner. Nobody wants to go to a restaurant with 10 people and you pay so much money you get hurried mm -hmm. along and you can't even talk to each other because the restaurant's so loud anyway. And mm -hmm. you could have just made spaghetti and meatballs and had people over. So I love doing very casual food scaled up. Um, I like making fewer dishes instead of more dishes. Now this is just like a, just the way I prefer. Like I want to make, I will make three things and that's it. Like, and I will make a lot of them, like a giant heap. I will make a tremendous amount of French fries. I did this weeks ago. Mm -hmm. I'll make a tremendous amount of salad and a tremendous amount of, but I don't, I won't, I don't like to make a lot of small things because mm -hmm. I feel like that really wears you out. Mm -hmm. But it's, well, this is a whole thing, but like my, um, my in-laws um, are Russian. There's a completely different entertaining culture where there's many little dishes. Mm. It's called zakuski and you like cover the whole table with it and it's really fun to eat your way through, but it's not for, for me when I'm hosting. <laughs> Um, so I love having people over and I love to pick something really casual. I think there was always this time where people picked like fancy food and there was entertaining food, but I think it's very silly and there's no need to make fancy food. You could just make regular food and make it well and that's special. And I'm a big fan of pretty much everything being made in advance that you can. Mm -hmm. The only thing I really want to do at the last minute is like reheat something. So something like a braised meat or something that really keeps well is really nice to have people over for because it tastes fantastic on the mm -hmm. second or third day. So you're not sweating. I want to enjoy mm -hmm. the party. It would be a huge sad thing if you had an amazing party and you didn't get to come. Like yeah. because you were in the kitchen fighting something like at the last minute that yeah. you could have cooked in advance. <laughs> what about cooking with people? I, you know, Tamar Adler's book, Everlasting mm -hmm. Meal. And I feel like one thing I really took from that is she sort of like put your guests to work, you know, like sit somebody down and get them to like pull the leaves off the parsley. Do you ever do that? Nope. No. <laughs> control. I mean, it's a control no, question, I just, like, right? Here's my thing. When you're a guest, uh -huh. I want you to be a guest. I don't want you bringing anything. I've okay. got this. I will cover, I will cook everything. We will pick up the wine. I don't like the roulette of it. I want everything uh -huh. to be exactly the way I uh -huh. want it. We'll buy a case of wine. We'll just do whatever. When I come over to your place, could I please do nothing? But it's such a joke because I'm incapable of doing nothing. I will bring the salad. I will bring homemade bread. And I will also bring, like, like the joke is, like, anytime you go somewhere, like, my husband, like, schleps, like, two bags of, like, cooked food. Uh -huh. But I, I want you to, like, so my... Oh my goodness, I'm getting in trouble here. I like the spirit of a potluck, but I don't like the idea that, <laughs> let's say you're having a potluck and it's Saturday night. Every one of your friends is stuck in the kitchen right now all for one meal when only one person could be in the kitchen and everybody yeah. else could be enjoying their days. And then that you can, you know, they can do that for you one day. I want to do things where I have people come over and like fold dumplings together or something. That I feel like I then you can like sit around the table and you're doing something with your hands, but That's amazing. you can also talk, right? I was actually just bugging a friend to do that because okay. he did that two years ago and it was so fun. Yeah, it's it was fun. before the pandemic, probably within two yeah. years ago, right? Um, but he had a dumpling folding party and it was so fun. It's really great for the kids. That's a good one. Um, I want to ask you about a few things like speed round, Foods, making it yourself versus buying it. Sure. Uh, worth it, not worth it. Let's see if Deb is capable of a right. one-word answer. Or uh, two answer. It doesn't have to be too speedy. <laughs> um, pasta, like egg pasta. Make, 
Yes. Yeah, I'm like, well, it's complicated, right? <laughs> we can go into I the new one in the first round. <laughs> um, in general, I think it's you don't need to make it from scratch. I think there are certain places where it'll show up. Where mm-hmm. if it's the star, I think homemade lasagna noodles are really yeah. nice. But I don't think if you're making spaghetti and meatballs, you need to make the spaghetti yourself. I don't think it adds that much at that point. Mm-hmm. Ice cream. Is it the only? T- <laughs> <laughs> If it's the only dessert I'm serving, I will probably make it from scratch. Okay. Otherwise, I would probably buy it. But sorbet is a completely different thing. I don't think I don't I don't care what brand you tell me. No store bought sorbet is has anything on homemade sorbet. Homemade sorbet is a compl- is the entire the reason. The fruit I have ratios are never. It just tastes so fresh. Mm-hmm. It's so fresh when you make it yourself, and that's what I wanted. That's why I actually have an ice cream machine, not for like vanilla or chocolate. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, sourdough bread. I don't make it. It is not worth it to me. Uh-huh. It would be worth it to me to have a neighbor who made it. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. I heard about everybody in the pandemic. They had neighbors yeah. who were making sourdough. I looked around and I said, you guys are a huge disappointment to me. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody, I don't want to have I any of those kinds of neighbors. A friend of mine told me her 13, this afternoon, that yeah. her 13-year-old daughter has gotten into making sourdough. And I'm like, what do I have to do? I want somebody adjacent to me to have a sourdough habit um, that I can benefit from. Uh, I have two children to keep alive, and that's really all I can handle right now. (laughs) For me, the problem with sourdough is, like, fridge space. Because, like, trying to prove things overnight in the fridge, and you need room for, like, two big bowls. Yeah. My fridge is always jammed with But you live in Vancouver, so you can put it in your outdoor fridge, right? I mean, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Like the balcony? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's our outdoor (laughs) fridge. (laughs) Yes. Uh, What about croissants? No, absolutely not worth it to me. (laughs) No, there is no reason. I think the best I've done is, like, an okay croissant. It's always more than you need. You're gonna, you're, you can't make less than twelve. Like, uh-huh. You're gonna make twelve, and the other ones are gonna go bad, or you're gonna eat way too much, and then have a stomachache and hate them. Plus, there's people who are really good at it, and I'm fine with them doing it. Um, what about like sauerkraut or kimchi mm. or that kind of fermenty guys? I would love to make my own kimchi. Um, I think I need a more ventilated space than uh-huh. I do. Maybe the <laughs> maybe the outdoor kitchen, as I call it. Uh-huh. Um, I would love to, but um, I like it when other people make it too and bring it over. <laughs> granola? Definitely worth making. Actually, I don't really like any store-bought granola. Agreed. Texture? Yeah, or it's always just too sweet and too mm-hmm. much filler. Mm-hmm. Um, what about like junk food, like Oreos or Cheetos? I love Cheetos. <laughs> I would never make them from scratch. Me neither. <laughs> Have you seen the picture of Leonard Cohen buying Cheetos? Oh, I knew he was, I knew. I knew he and I had a thing. <laughs> right? <I knew. laughs> Our relationship was special and unique. <laughs> May he rests in peace. Um, I um, actually am not crazy about Oreos, which I understand is like, <gasps> I get like my entire family thinks I'm insane. Um, I don't dislike them. Like yeah, they taste good, but they same. don't do it for me. So homemade, store-bought, doesn't really matter. Yeah. I'm into the cookies and cream flavor combination. Mm-hmm. So that I like to do homemade versions of. Mm-hmm. I used Oreos in like a pie crust to, to make like Sola's okay. chocolate pudding pie. That okay, was good. see, I would be really into that. That was good. I also love if you get, you know, a jar or bag of black cocoa powder, that is what Oreos yeah, taste yeah. and smell like. You'll open it up and it smells like ground up Oreos. So you can very easily replicate the flavor at home mm-hmm. with whatever you want to make. What about like cured fish? Have you ever made lox? No, nope. no, not even a big fan of it to Me be honest. Either. Don't tell my Russian in-laws. Yeah, <laughs> or all okay. of the Jews of New York that I don't yeah. put lox on my bagels. <laughs> uh, what about jam? I love homemade jam. I think it's really special when somebody, made, especially when they have like peak fruit, you know, mm-hmm. peak season fruit. So I would say it's worth it okay. if you're making it for me. Yeah. <laughs> nice. I do not have access to an orchard, but yeah, I think uh-huh. it would be really fun if you had okay. that kind of thing. Definitely. I get bulk pears from the. Do you make pear jam? I do make pear jam. And do you make pear butter? I have it. I like this pear jam that's like pear, vanilla, and lemon, and it turns pink. Oh. It's really beautiful. Oh, I want that. I'll send you some. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I work. <laughs> it should have brought some. Yeah. All right. Speed round done. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask you a little bit about cookbooks, partly especially because we're in a library. We're here for a writer's mm-hmm. event. Like, what is the cookbook as a genre of book to write? What does it mean to think about the cookbook as a, an act of writing, not, as well as an act of recipe developing or cooking? 
I think for me, the most fundamental thing is that it is a physical yeah. object and it is a permanent object. The way, I mean, I understand the web is permanent, but I can edit a recipe from 2006 right now if I want. Updated but this is photos. Like, exactly, I update <laughs> photos, thank goodness. Update recipe steps that are troublesome, so I can't do that. So it has to have a, a finality to it. Um, I mean, technically, everything should have all the errors removed before mm. I publish it, but you know, generally, that's mm -hmm. the goal. <laughs> um, I also feel like it needs to work as a unit in a way that my mm. site does not need to. Sure. Like there needs to be a balance. Like I'm like, oh wait, we already have a turkey recipe, or mm. I've done, I've used avocados twice here. So it's this like sort of thesis. distribution of ingredients, di distribution of effort, yeah. which is for me makes it a lot harder for me to come up not to come up with, but I tend to really, especially in this last book, I feel like I probably have. 250 recipes I pulled just to end up with 100 mm. in the book mm -hmm. that are just out there waiting for me to find a better home for them. Mm -hmm. If you think about the three cookbooks, if you were to sort of describe each one as a personality, how would you characterize them? I think the first one is an insecure first child. <laughs> but with great brunch options. Yes. <laughs> I think the second one is a little schizophrenic, like in like where there's like some really great everyday stuff and then there's some stuff that I'm like, this is escape from the drudgery of every day where I'm trying to do both things at once. Mm -hmm. I think there's a bit of both. Mm -hmm. um, and the third book... Um, I think it's my favorite child. I know that's so weird to say, but it might be. I think I, I just, I think it's perfect. Like I'm still bragging about it. Yeah. Like not bragging about, it, but I'm still like, like in a group text with my friends. I'm like, wait, you didn't make the harissa pot roast? Why not? What are you waiting for? I don't know what you're waiting for. Yeah, why yeah. haven't you made it yet? There are so many things in there that mm -hmm. we are still making mm -hmm. all of the time. At least once a week, I'm still cooking out of that book, and I hate cooking recipes I've already made. It doesn't mm -hmm. interest me at all. I want to make new things, so that's wild for me too. If somebody was just going to go home and pick one thing from that cookbook to make, what would you say? Well, now we're talking about the Harissa Padros. You should okay. definitely make that. Okay. But um, also the, um, the, the, the creamy masala chickpeas, somebody mentioned those mm -hmm. to me this morning, and they are really good My friend good Hannah made cozy. those the other day. They're really good. And uh, there's a couple, there's also um, a sort of Caesar-y skillet white beans. There's a couple things where you're just mm -hmm. kind of doctoring up a can of beans, but I really love these dishes. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you will too. <laughs> I like the pearl couscous with the eggplant on top. Yeah, thank you. I really love that one too. too. Um, there's a chicken harm, there's chicken with dumplings. The guy made peace with chicken in this book. And so I've always kind of like been like, chicken, really? Oh, people eat that by choice. I really like, but I feel like I've gotten there, but yeah. it has to be specific ways. Um, so when you talk about the masala chickpeas, mm -hmm. What is it like when you're developing a recipe that's maybe from a culture or a kind of origin that you don't have a connection with? Do you approach that differently or do you think about that differently? Definitely, for yeah. sure. I definitely was talking to my friend Renu. Um, she's like, I'm not a cooking expert, but she put me on the phone with her mother, okay. who is. Uh -huh. Her Punjabi mother is like talking to me about it. And even though she was just very helpful and kind of, I just wanted to understand, I wanted to make sure I wasn't making a thing that existed that I was calling it something that was, sure. you know, I obviously did not invent this, but you know, it's just this idea of taking sort of like a butter chicken, but it's not really with butter, it's with cream, and applying it to chickpeas, but also in my very simplified kind of skillety way. Um, mm -hmm. So I definitely feel like there's a lot more levels of research that go into it, and there's a lot more conversations that I'm having. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I like that, because yeah. I feel like it's, I like trying, I mean, it's, I'll, it's more work, because I'm worried about getting it wrong, but at the mm -hmm. same time, I like, the idea of having a real conversation about food because there's the idea of inventing a recipe is crazy or inventing mm -hmm. a dish. So when you start talking about like where all the places it has its roots, there's a much more interesting story to tell. And sure. I am, you know, honored to be the vessel for this story. When do you feel like, so I know often you'll kind of taste something or you'll riff mm -hmm. on something. When do you feel like something is kind of distinct enough that you're like, this is now my version or this is something I would put in a cookbook? Usually there's a point where yeah. it's, generally I'll just talk about where it comes from rather than yeah, having yeah. a hem and haw over whether I invented sure. it because I just think it's it's easier, I sleep better at night. Yeah. Um, there is certainly a point, I just 
poke myself in the eye. I, don't know how I did that. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot where my hair was. Um, so there's definitely a point where I tend to source everything and I'm always like, well, I got this idea from here and this idea. And sometimes I look back, I'm like, this is ridiculous. It doesn't have one ingredient overlap anymore with this recipe. And it's almost more complicated to explain it than mm -hmm. it is. And that might be the point where like one credit, like every, sure. every thought that came into my head doesn't have to be footnoted. Uh -huh. <laughs> so there's that kind of point. But in general, I just think it's more interesting when you tell the whole story. And I can say from like April Bloomfield, I love the way she cooks her lentils and I love the way this cookbook mm -hmm. author does this. And it's none of those recipes and none of those dishes, but I think it's fun yeah. to talk about inspiration. I mean, that's another way maybe to think about you as a writer is, you know, and I think that's partly why people have connected with <laughs> your food is the stories behind them and, you know, knowing, you know, what, what led you to a recipe or when you turned to it or what it meant within the context of your family. I think that that openness to kind of bring us into your world lets people feel like they're close to you and connect, you know? Thank you. I think head notes matter and I like yeah. to read them, especially when it's relatable or it explains why, why this recipe, why now? The same thing you're trying to do in any news article. Mm -hmm. Why this recipe? Like, why now? What, what does it mean to you? Why you should want to make What's different about it? Because every question is going to be about that. Mm -hmm. Why not do it this way? You know, what is it improving on? I don't know. I feel like there's so many good questions a head note can answer. Mm -hmm. I've seen that you have a new project <laughs> in a maybe, as far as I know, new medium for you, which is <laughs> podcast with Kenji Lopez Alt. Have you done his dry cured salmon thing, by the way? No, I haven't. It's really good. Okay. You should try it. <laughs> it's we'll awesome. Do an but tell me about this. Uh, well, we're just starting it and actually kind of started about a year. It's funny because I'm coming to Seattle tomorrow and I'd be in yeah, conversation yeah. with him. And, but a year ago, um, I was in Seattle on book tour and he interviewed me and we it was actually the first time I'd ever met him. I'd never met him before. Um, and I told him, you know, I'm a big fan of your work, but I'm, I'm actually a little freaked out by your fans. Um, <laughs> they're very like enthusiastic yeah. about him. <laughs> yeah. um, and he said that he was too. <laughs> if I, if I, I, think if I, I think I'm quoting him correctly on that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, people. but we had a great conversation afterwards. He's like, you know, I've always wanted to do a podcast. I'm like, I've always wanted to do a podcast mm. too. And I was always kind of keeping an ear out for her, who the other person would be. So that's where it started. Okay. We are both involved in a lot of different things and not great outsourcers. So mm -hmm. it took a while um, for us to shop it around and stuff, but it does officially launch next month with Radiotopia. And we've officially recorded two episodes okay. and technically today we should have recorded our third, but I was busy. <laughs> <laughs> You're here with us. Yes. Um, but so we're going to, um, so we're, I, we're going to see what form it takes. Okay. We're going to see. But the idea is, I think we go. might talk about a food each episode. Um, okay. Our first episode is going to be about stovetop macaroni and cheese. Ooh. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of comfort food and a uh -huh. lot of like the different ways that we approach the classics. We both are really obsessive recipe developers, but we have different perspectives mm -hmm. on it. Um, and I think that together there's a good conversation. How would you say you're different in that? I will not do what he's willing to do to get a recipe right. Okay. <laughs> um, but um, I think that, you know, he's very, you know, he's got the scientific knowledge yeah. and he's really, he's very good at understanding the way ingredients interact and it, he often has a version of a recipe that will be unquestionably the best version you've ever made. But for me, I will be in such a bad mood after finishing a 16 ingredient recipe mm -hmm. and dinner will be so late, I will never make it again. So for me, it's missing that. Like sometimes it, even if it's perfect, yeah. for me, perfect, for me, a per for him, a perfect recipe is like, it's a perfectly, it's a perfect like, recipe. For me, a perfect recipe is, I also don't hate making it. Yeah, it can fit in your life. <laughs> um, yeah. And so I'm not saying I hate making his recipes, sure. it's not, but I, that, that's sort of the last piece and I wish more, I wish there was more conversations about cooking that were yeah. also about like the joy and mm -hmm. excitement and also possible exhaustion you might feel mm -hmm. doing it. Cause I think that's a huge piece. Mm -hmm. Like is the cook happy? Mm -hmm. There's some, <laughs> have you, like Suzanne Goyne, mm -hmm. like Sunday Suppers at Luke, I love that cookbook, but it's definitely a like, now you will cook each ingredient mm -hmm. individually and like pull the leaves off the time oh and like, 
It's if really one of my favorite If you're in the mood for a project, <laughs> it's so beautiful, it's, but like you've got to be ready for a It's a restaurant project. cooking. Yeah. yeah. This is for your restaurant ready dinner meal, yeah. um, for dinner party. But yeah, I'm much more excited to find like there's a couple techniques in there that I think are absolutely, you know, worth it every mm -hmm. time. And then putting that with something that's much simpler so we can mm -hmm. pull it off on a Tuesday. Totally. Um, what's it like? doing something without images, right? Because so much of cooking and the blog or the cookbook, right? It's like the seeing and you can see and then you can kind of imagine you can taste. And what is it like to work with without visual in the context of a podcast? Um, I don't mind it. Yeah. It doesn't bother me at all. I've always thought I had a face for radio anyway. So. Oh, <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> um, but I um, I think it's sort of fun. I think yeah. there's a lot of ways to talk about cooking that you don't. It doesn't have to be so visually based. I, I enjoy that sort of pressure off. There's a lot of extra work that goes into making imagery, and it, I think it can take away from the conversation. So mm -hmm. it's nice to just be able to chat about it. But you guys will have to let me know when you yeah. listen to the podcast. So coming. Uh, the first episode, I think it's coming, it's like the third week in February, the first okay. episode should be a third or fourth. Very exciting. Coming. <laughs> All right. Um, we have some time for some questions, and I believe there's microphones that folks can circulate there. So, um, yeah. Got one in the corner maybe already, and... Yeah? Is this on? Oh my God. Yes. yes it is. <laughs> we hear you. Okay. Is this better? Um, I'm just wondering if you can share um, the first time you had a dish or an ingredient or um, a preparation style, something that kind of changed the trajectory of your cooking. Like mm -hmm. when I first made a semolina flour cake, I was like, oh my God, this is so amazing. And it kind of. You know, I became obsessed with semolina flour cakes and, that, and that's kind of become part of my reper repertoire. Um, I'm just wondering if you can share an anecdote or story of, of an ingredient you had that kind of, it was not part of your everyday and then it became that way. Love that. Oh my goodness, I'm trying to think how many do I? Yeah. <laughs> I'm very lucky. Um, and I wanna pick something fun too. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'm two off the top of my head. I love cooking with tomato paste. I feel like it's such an underrated ingredient. I think we think of it as like something supplemental or like a lesser form of canned tomato. But I think sometimes when you're going for a silkier tomato sauce or a you know, tomatoey broth soup, it's a really easy way to get there and get the flavor without having to like, I don't know, cook down and blend and puree and all this stuff. So I love using tomato paste and I feel like I use it in a lot of things that it doesn't normally have to be in. And I'm also thinking of, there is a chocolate, well, I have a chocolate olive oil cake on this site that is egg and dairy free. And I really like the combination of chocolate and olive oil to the point that I played around with it. that there's a spread, a spread right? there's a spread yeah. in the book. And then I just did a chocolate olive oil brownie. And I, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I'd started as a, well, I couldn't use butter in this, but the truth is I love the combination. I make them it's all like the time. like poetry. Constraints are useful for yeah. creativity, right? I, I absolutely think constraints are useful. So I had a lot of fun, actually, when my sister-in-law was off dairy for yeah. <laughs> in, the, in the early months of having her baby, we're um, playing around with recipes and mm -hmm. figuring out other ways to do it. And I love the fruity complexity of olive oil with like a dark, bitter chocolate. Mm. It's so great with the sea salt. Um, so does that count? That's, that, that's two things. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Another question, maybe here? Yeah? Uh, did you grow up with, uh, in a home where there was a lot of cooking and did you participate? I'm just going to repeat since we didn't get the mic to you in time. So the question was, did you grow up in a home with a lot of cooking and did you participate if so? So I grew up in a home with cooking. I wouldn't say it was a particularly large amount of cooking. I mean, my mom was definitely making dinner most nights, um, but maybe not every night. And I don't think I was a huge participant, um, oddly, which is funny, because now I'm like, I don't think my kids participate that much. But I wasn't in any way raised to be afraid of cooking. Like, you know, um, I did not know that egg whites were difficult to whip or that yeast was scary to work with. Like, it's not like my mom was making homemade bread. It was just like you just follow the recipe mm -hmm. and, you know, you have to use clean beaters and stuff like that. But 
So I think in that way, it was like a lack of intimidation about cooking. If but you don't know to be scared, then you're not scared. Exactly. It didn't occur to me that cooking was scary or difficult. Mm. So I guess that is a gift in itself. <laughs> mm -hmm. Austin? <laughs> so this question comes from, I made your fudgy chocolate cake into a wedding cake one time. Wow. Um, what is the nicest anecdote you've gotten about a recipe in terms of like the life it has had oh outside God. of the so oh question goodness. about the afterlife or what a recipe has gone on to do that you've heard about or that you've done? And this isn't one specific example, but I am telling you that every summer, my recipes have the best life. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the places they go, people send me pictures. They're like, this is at our lake cabin. Here's the sunset and Adirondacks behind it. Like, here's, <laughs> oh, we're in Paris this year, and here's your cake. It's cooling on, you know, on my terrace <laughs> in my houseman apartment. I mean, I'm like, I'm just so happy for them. Like, they're just like doing so well. And I love seeing the pictures of like all these recipes I made in my like, terrible kitchen in the East Village mm. going to live at these amazing places. So it's, I'm like, it's bittersweet and lovely. So <laughs> I love all the pictures. The more absurd, the better. I, people are like, here, we made this on our houseboat. Um, <laughs> we made this, you know, we were skiing um, in the Alps and we made, the, like I just, not even just the summer, every vacation, it's so fun to see it. Mm. Some of you have very nice houses and I'm <laughs> so honored that you let my basic cakes in there. <laughs> well traveled. I love it. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, What's your podcast going to be called? It is called The Recipe with Kenji and Deb, and I want you to know the ridiculous amount of weeks we spent discussing which name should go first. Oh. And how adamantly Kenji wanted my name first and I wanted his name first because it I thought it sounded better, but he's like, but sexism and alphabetical. I'm like, but it just sounds better. Anyway, so if you feel like the name should have been the other way around, trust me, 50% of the people in the room agreed. Um, but so it's called The Recipe with Kenji and Deb. <laughs> and you can probably subscribe now, like it exists as a thing, but I there's nothing it. in the yeah. there's nothing in the channel. There's yet. stars already though, so people are like already rating it based on anticipation. <laughs> so many so. new people to disappoint. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure, but it's got good stars so far. Okay, no pressure. Yes. All right, uh, there, you, you, yeah. Ooh, you know, I don't follow a ton of food YouTubers, but I love TikTok. I love TikTok. <laughs> I love, and of course, I always do this. I completely blank on some of the people that I follow the most because they're just handles to me and not sure. like words that I say out loud. But I love all the cooking energy on TikTok. I like, there's so much, and it's it's not just the bro chefs. I mean, there's those too, but like, there's just like, I always think of Cafe Haley. She's wonderful. I think you guys would love her. Like, I know you would. Um, and I'm like in a completely blank on so many other food people I follow, but I just love like a different, there's a different rhythm to the cooking. It's a little less recipe centric and a little bit more about the process. Um, and I think it's really enjoyable to watch and there's a lot of younger people and I feel like the kitchens are less fancy mm -hmm. and like everything's less showy and so it's got a really good vibe. Some of them, some of them. <laughs> what about cookbooks that you're enjoying right now or that you're oh looking forward goodness. to that are coming out? Um, I am loving Sola's cookbook. Yeah. Um, cook, I feel like I'm going to completely blank on the title. I'm like, you know, the one with the thing. Start thingy. here, is that it? Start here, yeah. yeah. So I was going to say cook, like, which is not good. Um, I love Susan Gowen's book. Uh -huh. um, what else? I'm like, what if have I been, you done any Hetty McKinnon's? I, all of her books are so okay. wonderful. And Tender Heart is such a special yeah. book. If you're looking for vegetable inspiration, I love to. I don't know why you don't have well. all of her books. Um, Super good. Yeah, all of her books are wonderful. And she's such a she's such a prolific person. I talked to her once in a while. I'm like, how do you do so much? I don't even do so many things. I do like a quarter of those things and I'm very tired. So I think she's made of something that normal people are not. Said the person who has three cookbooks and a website. In 10 and years I wrote three and, uh, cookbooks. <laughs> In uh -huh. for 12 years I wrote three cookbooks. Okay, okay. <laughs> and I felt a little rushed on that. So I'm not, <laughs> I'm, I'm a turtle. <laughs> 
Um, gosh, there's so I'm like complete. I have so much a beautiful stack of cookbooks, and there's a brand new one that I just got this week. It's coming out this spring, and it's Island Cooking. And I completely forgot the name of my agent, mm. who also did that book, is probably screaming at home right now. Mm because she sent me the book because she knew I'd like it. So I'm very helpful, guys. You should just message me and I will, I'm will. i gonna put it on like Instagram and remind awesome. everybody when I think of these book titles. Yeah. It's a really beautiful book. I just saw that Priya Krishna has a cookbook for kids coming out. It's gonna be great. I'm, I'm hoping to get that. to feature it on the podcast. Yay. We'll see. Awesome. <laughs> um, it should be really fun. Yeah, um, yeah. There are so many. Um, Kushbu Shah, um, she was the restaurant editor for Food and Wine for the last few years. Her first cookbook, I think it's coming out this spring. I got to preview it. It's really fun. It's really fresh. Um, and I like I like that one a lot. Um, I think Zoe Bakes, um, who's just a wonderful baker, she's got a cookie book coming out, but now I'm going to get in trouble if it's not till the fall. Mm -hmm. I thought it was spring. It might be fall, but I got to preview that, and it's really good, too. Awesome. So I don't know. Ask me. I'm like, I know, I know all of them, but I can't think of any. Not very good. <laughs> You're fine. It's always like, what are your favorite authors? And it's like... I just freeze. <laughs> I just, like, how many, like, head notes and everything I write, yeah. but ask me to put, like, two lines in a birthday card. I'm like, I don't know what to say. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have words for this. <laughs> we got time for maybe a couple more questions. Let's see, way in the back there. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> so question was... Someone who has also had a tiny New York kitchen, which I've also had. Mm -hmm. uh, what? No, oh, no, a tiny Vancouver kitchen. What does your dream kitchen look like? Oh my goodness! It's, I have spent so little time dreaming about a nice kitchen. It's weird. <laughs> it's weird. Like it's like a you mental just block. Let go of, of the dream. I'm completely at peace with mine. I would like better furniture in it like I keep I have this like wobbly cart and then I replace it and then the another, next cart gets a wobbly and I'm like if only we had furniture makers who could make something that wouldn't be wobbly for me. Um, I have most of my fantasies are just about taking something and using this space better. Like I do think I've not great space, but okay space. And I like the light in my kitchen, but I would love to like gut it and put in proper counters. I would like to put it, I mean, do, do refrigerators exist that don't freeze things in the back? <laughs> I was like, is it just that I don't have a very nice one, or is this all refrigerators? Because I haven't really gotten to the bottom of this. Oh, I want one of those refrigerators that opens like, like this. two doors. Fancy. Uh -huh. Like, my husband wants one of those cars that opens like this. I want a fridge that opens <laughs> like this. <laughs> it's like the, the woman version. Um, that seems really fun. I, I always, like, fantasize, like, if I had one of these, like, I would not have a mess disorganized fridge but we, we probably do know better right okay um so mostly it's just about like a more stable mm -hmm. quality in kitchen a, in a small kitchen what are some things that are worth having and what are some things that are not worth the space I'm not a big fan of salad spinners. I don't know like they, what they did to hurt me but I just like I feel <laughs> like they just take up a lot of space and fun this is really the the crux of the issue here I feel that the lettuce is not dry after you're done spinning it, and that for me is the deal breaker. If it was you dry, the, the roll it in a. I do roll it. I have I have a video on that. Um, but um, I just basically soak it in cold water, which uh -huh. also crisps it. Yeah. Shake it out. I roll up it in a towel, and I might leave it actually rolled in that towel for an hour or two if I'm getting ready for a dinner party, mm -hmm. or after that if it's going to be if I'm prepping a couple days in advance, I might just um, put it in a big freezer bag. I always put like extra air in there, and then I usually put like a paper towel on the bottom and at the top. And I'm telling you. The lettuce lasts so long when you do it that way. Um, but I just don't use it. And then, um, by the way, been, the towel, all it's been used for is drying lettuce. So it's clean. You can keep using it. It's uh -huh. just, these are my rules. Uh -huh. Okay? Uh-huh. You can continue using it for a kitchen towel. <laughs> what is worth it? I mean, I have an electric juicer. I don't know that everybody needs... Oh, I have an electric citrus juicer. And the no. Like, the little twirly guy? Oh, God, it makes yeah. me so happy. Because, you know, when you're deprived of sunlight and... Yeah brightly colored energetic fruit in the winter, I feel like, you know, fresh lemonade, limeade, you know, grapefruit juice is so special. So I don't think everybody needs it, but if it's, if you it are this you person, joy. you can also make pretty good margaritas with it. Mm -hmm. um, just throwing that out there. Um, so I love it. I don't think everybody needs it, but if that's like your thing that makes you happy, I think you should get yourself the machine that makes you happy. Okay. We got a couple questions coming in from online um, about either your favorite bean dish Ooh. or uh, if you have a good recipe for a plum cake. We got bean appreciators and plum appreciators in the audience. Mm. 
Well, the best plum cake of all time is the Marion um, Burroughs, um, the Purple Plum Tort, the New York Times is published every year for 20 years. It's mm -hmm. a very classic kind of, um, what's it called, a buckle cake, where yeah, you have a sort yeah. of a stiff batter, um, mm -hmm. and then the fruit starts on top and ends up buckled inside the cake, and it's absolutely delicious, and it's so good. So I feel like you can't beat that. I mean, I have other plum cakes that make this. This person says, I love your purple plum tort. I've been making it for right. years. Do you have a good recipe for a plum cake? So I wonder that's if it's the tort that's cake. And I also yeah. have one. I have another one who, so I have, I do a version of Dory Greenspan's um, dimply plum cake, and mm. that's a really fun one because I use sugar plums for that, but it's whole plum halves, and you mm -hmm. just sink them in, and it's really, because the, the batter is pretty sturdy, it's amazing on the second and third day. It really just... Soaks in and it gets very good. Have you good. made Samin Nosrat's cardamom almond tea cake? Oh my god, I would love that so much. <laughs> that, that is that is the cake that got fan. me this gig. So oh, I recommend it. Goodness. It's real good. I would love to. I got to meet her. She interviewed me in San Francisco last year, and I'm still like, uh -huh. oh my god, oh my yeah. god, oh my god. And I think I don't know. I feel like she's working on a cookbook. Oh yeah, she is. Be and guys, yeah, it's yeah, going yeah. to be so good. We were talking about it a year ago. I feel like I shouldn't even be like, she's, she should be the one. It's going to be so good. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, talk about a, a, a publishing event, how yeah. rarely she writes a cookbook. You just show up on the day that comes out and you buy it. I've seen some peaks of illustrations. I think there's some very like painterly. She's, like, oh, yeah. she's just like the most wonderful human being. Um, so there was something about beans. Yeah. I don't know, the perfect bean dish is like whatever bean dish I'm craving, but I recently <laughs> made, um, I basically, it's like kind of sauteed white beans, it's kind of a little wintry, it's not like a gravy, but it's a sauce like that where it has like a little richness to it with a broth, there's some sweet cooked onions in there, and then I throw in some greens, and then I cover it with some breadcrumbs and a little bit of cheese, so it's mm. kind of like kind a of crunchy, grit I use some Gruyere, but okay. I also like with Parmesan, so like yeah, a mix. Yeah. It's okay. not supposed to be a heavy cheese layer. Not a gooey, layer. gooey. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's not super gooey. It's just like, it's like more of a flavor thing and the crust, and it's really nice. Beautiful. And I should write that up. Yeah. Yeah. I should stop <laughs> traveling and like update Being my website. <laughs> I know, I'm withholding on so many recipes. <laughs> <laughs> not fair. <laughs> um, maybe just ask you before we wrap up, so, I've recently been obsessed with cardamom, and especially mm. like grinding my own cardamom. Um, what is either a recipe or a technique or a discovery that you're obsessed with or that you wanna like experiment with in the coming days? Specifically about, oh, oh I, was gonna, I was gonna say, if you do have cardamom, I really think it's nice to grind it up with sugar, like the cardamom yeah, sugar yeah. you might use to make a cardamom bun. I was working on a cardamom bun recipe last year for a little while, and it's good, but I just still feel like the bakery down the street makes them better, and I'm, I'm okay, okay with that. It's okay. in the croissant category. The extra cardamom sugar, though, is so nice to keep around. It keeps the way vanilla sugar does, mm -hmm. and so I highly recommend doing that with any extra you have. Um, it's just a really nice thing to sprinkle into baked goods, or you put it in mm -hmm. you know, as a sweetener. Um, what am I really into right now? Lentils? God, Deb, you're so lentils. boring. Len Who says Ooh. lentils? Like, I think I was just, I feel, I always feel My like bean recipes. My aunt made your recent lentil dish. <laughs> See, I feel yeah. like people were into bean recipes, but lentils were a hurdle. And now I feel like the energy is changing. I'm like, oh, if I can see more lentil recipes, forget lentils, it, guys. your moment forget has it. come. It's coming. <laughs> Beautiful. Hetty <laughs> McKinnon has a good like roasted sweet potatoes with maple scallion butter and lentils. Yeah, that sounds perfect. I want that. It's very delicious. I want that right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, well, now I think we're all hungry. Um, <laughs> so you're welcome. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Um, I want to leave plenty of time so that um, you can come and say hi to Deb and get a book signed. So there's books over there available. Uh, Deb will be over here ready to sign. Um, and thank you so much thank for you. chatting with me. Thank you all for coming. And thank thanks you. so much to the library, Vancouver Writers Fest. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>